the system administration mini conf. Um, we have three talks in this afternoon slot if you're um, in a time zone near the conference. Um, first up, we have Stephen Ellis talking about rootless containers with Podman. Over to you, Stephen. Hey, thanks, Ewan, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so pleased to see the system in mini conf as part of the program yet again. So um, I'm going to cover off um, uh, some aspects of rootless containers and, and how you can use them using Podman. Um, a number of you have seen me present at Linux Conf before. I'm going to keep this fairly tight because of the time frame. But um, one of my roles at Red Hat is to talk to customers about certain emerging technology trends and talk to them about containerization. And something that keeps coming up are some of the security concerns about dealing with containers. So I thought, well, I'll dig into this a bit further and, and actually get my hands dirty with the technology because I like to do that. Um, please note that there's some technical content here, particularly at the back of the deck, I'm going to provide for later reference. Uh, and most of the code I've given you is kind of copy pastable. So what I'm going to do is give you a bit of an overview of the containers and how that relates to the Podman tools. Uh, I'm going to assume that you know what containers are and that you've got a little bit of background in this area. And then a little bit about why we're going to talk about rootless containers. And at the end, we're going to round it up with a bit of an example of how to use this in action. Uh, and I'm going to actually use uh, Home Assistant Mosquito MQTT as part of that example. Now, one thing in the container ecosystem is the shift away from Docker everything to container standards. So. One thing here is the, the Open Container Initiative has defined a thing called Cryo as a standard interface for starting, stopping a container image. And Cryo is quite critical because it means that behind the scenes you can have any container runtime as long as it's Cryo compatible. Cryo's main focus is around Kubernetes because at the end of the day, Kubernetes simply needs to be able to start and stop containers. It doesn't need all the other things Docker can give you. And therefore, Cryo helps create a smaller attack surface because Docker does lots of things. In fact, when we look at some of the alternative tooling that we're developing with the open source community, Podman's focus is being able to run a container. Scopio's pro uh, ability to introspect, manage containers, and then Builder as a tool to build a container. Whereas Docker is a container standard, a container runtime, the tools to build and run and manage, and it presents a very, very broad attack surface. So we're just kind of narrowing things down, which I think is really good from a security perspective. So Podman provides a very familiar interface. Um, for anyone who uses the Docker CLI, you can pretty much alias Docker to Podman and use it as you would do naturally. In fact, with some of the new releases of Podman, we're going to be able to support uh, some of these kind of socket-centric features that, that Docker has today. But it's really nicely integrated with systemd and it has great support for running containers as non-root uh, for those of you on a, a non red hat flavored distribution there's a wide range of distos supported and huge support out of the, the debian and ubuntu community um, amongst others so there's a broad range of platforms from which you can go and play with podman today so now we'll dig into why you shouldn't get rooted. We don't want to get rooted. Um, anyone who's ever had a box rooted knows the, the the pain associated with that. And so why why would we talk about rootless containers? Because containers present uh, an encapsulated way to run a service. And we've got a nice security model. We've got SE Linux. We've got C groups. We've got SecConf. We've got all these things wrapped around. Surely our container is secure. But the fact is that's not necessarily true in the traditional um, Linux ecosystem would mostly solve this through uh, shims that would start a process so it can connect to a secure port and then allows it to run as a non-root user. Um, most things on your system run under service UIDs. You know, um, gone are the days where uh, a vendor's application install instructions said you must install this as root. In fact, I remember many years ago, a rather large database vendor presented me with an installation guide that said, run your server with X11 logged in as root and then run the following commands and leave the console active under the X11 environment with the screensaver turned off, which was just plain scary. The fact was if you use their particular um, flavor of Linux, you could actually do a yum install of their product with all the dependencies resolved but they wouldn't make that available for 
other Linux distributions. It was quite a bizarre situation. But I've seen this with things like uh, WebSphere, WebLogic, where they'd suggest you install it as root so it could connect to port 80. Who the hell wants to run a Java application server on port 80? So we've got past this now in traditional sysadministration, but there's still an expectation that your Docker images run as root. And if you want to build a new container image, usually you've got to run Docker as root to do that. Whereas rootless containers are, can be created, run, and managed by users without admin rights. That means on a box, you can have multiple unprivileged users running the same containers on the same machine. And now we're transitioning to tools and ISV provided applications and services appearing as containers. That's critically important. Everyone needs to be able to run containers. People need to be able to run the same container at the same time. So if we can do this under a user's identity, then we've simplified things. And should you really care? I mean, you could say, well, I don't care because I build all my containers from scratch, so therefore I know they're secure. Really? Every single one? Do you even build your base operating system that you use inside the container? Or perhaps you just use Go, so you don't actually have a base operating system inside the container. No user space. You're not running any community containers. It's amazing the uh, number of deployment definitions, whether they're Helm charts or Docker Compose or, uh, or using Kubernetes where they um, uh, and operators where they actually pull a community container alongside their commercial containers uh, in order to provide some services. So you don't run any community containers, no third-party commercial containers, no ISV provided containers, you, you know, your environment's really good, and your container platform, that's perfectly secure. Excellent. But at the end of the day, most of us will consume some kind of base OS for building our container images. How far do you trust it, whether it's Alpine, Ubuntu, or the UBI image? Uh, UBI 8 is a freely redistributable Relate container image from Red Hat that a number of commercial vendors we're seeing are starting to use. So things like Microsoft SQL Server is available based off the RHEL UBI 8 image. So if you're consuming commercial containers, how far do you trust them? How recently were they patched? Um, how are you going to avoid a potential security risk in your environment? So I care. I want to make sure that my customers' environments and my home environments are, are safe and secure. And there's lots of compromises. I'll you know, share these slides, look at the links, but the, the stack rocks analysis that happens uh, regularly is always quite enlightening. There's always new reports on the number of containers in Docker Hub with vulnerabilities. And in fact, there was a new Kubernetes vulnerability reported in the last week. So no matter what you're doing, there's always a risk and an issue. Everything we can do to mitigate that is useful. So let's do that. Let's go rootless. How can we run our uh, containers without root? So when I approach these things, I kind of like want to put myself in the mindset of the customer or the end user. I want to also validate the technology in a way that excites me. This is really important because otherwise I'll get bored and I'll go off and do something else or distracted. And I want to do something that's going to be interesting and important to me. I want to try and avoid cutting corners. So always run a proper secure lockdown environment and try and look at how it's relevant to a customer or an end user. But then I try to look at what do I need that could or should be in a container? Uh, using a third-party container. And many of these things, I could build, rebuild the container image myself, but at the end of the day, sometimes you just want to use a community build of a tool or a, um, a technology. So I looked at what I'm running around home, existing websites. I've got a track server with SVN and Git. I've been running Myth TV forever, but that's really kind of got to be on a, It's more of an appliance. My firewall is effectively a, a DDWRT appliance. Uh, I've got a few other things that I could try and replatform, but they're not that exciting. So let's talk about the, the Shiny. And the Shiny for me was home automation. I had some Xiaomi temperature sensors. I had a few uh, smart plugs that I'd hacked. Um, I wanted to be able to integrate these. So I was looking at home automation. And there's lots of people trying to run things like Home Assistant in a container. Uh, now, stepping back and taking a look at things like Podman, well, there's two ways of running a container rootless. You can either run it a container as a user where the 
inside the container, the process is still running as root, or we can run a container as a user and inside the container, the service is also running as a specified user. So I'm just gonna to switch to a terminal here because I've got, um, this is a, let me go. Here I'm actually running the Home Assistant container, which I've already pulled. I'm gonna run it as I'm a, as the user Fred. So I've logged in as the user Fred on this, this environment. And if I have a look now, inside the container, my ID is root. And if I look at there, you can see the user IDs are available and this guest and nobody available. Oh, okay. So let's kill that container and now let's actually run it as guest. Now I'm actually inside the container as the user guest, but the container, if I do a PS outside of it, will actually be running as the user Fred on the local system. So there's different ways of layering this from a security perspective. What's happened is in the container ecosystem, I almost got lazy and most of the time containers internally are running as root or the services run as root. I think that's a problem and it's something we're gonna to have to resolve in the long term. Um, but that's the, that's the nature of the ecosystem today. So what do you need to run rootless? Well, first you need Podman. Uh, there's ways of doing it with your straight Docker and other runtimes. Podman makes it very simple and easy. Um, 164 is kind of the minimum where things really started working. Ideally, you want to run a Podman 2.x release. Um, then you need the slip for NetNS package. That kind of helps handle some of the network namespace support. You need to increase the number of user namespaces so that we can actually um, create the user IDs that we need and the um, ecosystem we need to run these user space containers. Um, so again, every time I go to do one of these, try something out recently, I do a search online to see who's already had a go. And my friend, Chris Smart, it turns out has already had a go with Fedora, which was awesome. So that's pretty close to what I'm doing. I'm going to do it with RHEL. So I picked up his guide and I went and had a play because he's been through a lot of the, the pain points. So I created my user environment. The user has for home assistant. I created the new user IDs and group IDs I needed, uh, sub UIDs and group IDs I needed. But it turns out on most modern distros, you don't need to do it anymore. The moment you create the user, those additional IDs are created anyway. Uh, I then make sure I've got the correct SE Linux permissions on the things I'm going to map into the uh, container image and expose the service. Relatively painless, took a few minutes. I've actually been through these steps several times. And then we do some initial testing. So I'll just run the container, map in those local directories, uh, map in a local time as a read-only environment, and then bring the image online. And then do podman ps minus a, and yay, I've got the, the processes running. It's all good. Except it wasn't because there were some issues with trying to do this on uh, rel 8.1, which I'll, I'll talk to later. But Eventually, we got that resolved, everything came up. And then I can actually look at the logs inside that process, doing podman logs and the uh, container name. So everything looks really good. Everything was behaving nicely. What I wanted to do then was make it work as a system service. And so there's an example of a um, service definition. So then the, the container starts, is able to start, stop, restart cleanly via systemd. Perfect. What I also needed because of the way some of my devices are configured was an MQTT server. And it turns out Mosquito MQTT is perfect fit. It's actually got a very, very simple startup. And in the case of my environment, I'm running it completely stateless. So every time I start and stop it, never has any persistent configuration. Um, now I could, and in theory from a security perspective, modify this so that I'm actually using uh, passwords or keys for my devices and so forth. But the way I've got it at present is all of my IoT devices are on a specific dedicated network. So things are kind of locked down at the network level rather than the MQTT level. Again, here's a system D uh, example for bringing that up online. So now I've got a working um, Home Assistant environment with MQTT integrated and all my devices come online and I'm able to do some home automation. Awesome. 
So what's good, what's bad, what's frustrating? Well, what was frustrating at first was rootless support in RHEL 8 one Podman wasn't fully functional. There were some weird, weird memory issues and a couple of other side issues with rootless support. Uh, luckily, I could raise a few support cases and work with this with the team. So we actually managed to get um, early engineering builds of the next release of Podman. And so by the time we actually GA'd RHEL 8 to everything was working nicely. What was also frustrating is it would have been painless if I'd have just done it on Fedora. But coming back to my earlier statement, I want to run it on an environment that customers would run it on. So I had to try it out on RHEL. Um, it all works nicely now. And as of RHEL 8.2, it's all sweet. Um, not all containers are ready to be rootless. And it's not easy to identify that. So you may need to try things out. And most of them still need you to run as root inside the container. Um, I had some crash consistency issues at first. Uh, I, I lost power to the machine hosting the virtual machine that runs the containers. Um, so sometimes I've had to do a few podman commands to kind of clean up dead pods. That seems to have gotten a lot better with more recent podman builds. It's very easy to update the service. That's awesome. I can literally pull the container in advance, tell it to restart, and it will come back up with the latest container. I really shouldn't be doing run latest. I wouldn't be doing that if this was like a customer production environment. As I said earlier, there's the where, what you do at home and the way a customer will really use it. But that suits me because I'm managing when I actually do do a refresh and pull the latest. And and the, um, the, the upgrades are just really, really nice and painless. And it is possible for me to roll it back just by tweaking the version of the container I want to run. Overall, it feels safer. The uh, the risk of anyone trying to break out the container is low. Uh, if I'm using third party automation integrations that I don't necessarily trust, at least I know that they're not being run as a root user on uh, a system within my network. So overall, things come together quite well. I've got a bunch of useful references here. Uh, some of these are have follow-up links to other guides. There's some really good video series on using rootless containers with Podman. Uh, there's a lot of experimenting going on ahead of the Podman version 3 release. Um, so please go and have a play, try it out, uh, and reach out if you've got any questions or queries. And as I mentioned earlier, at the end of the deck, I've got a little bit more information about Cryo. Uh, if you're wondering what, the, what, the, what it entails and what its value is, and in addition, I've just linked to Builder because Podman's about running a container. Builder means any user can build a container. And it builds standard OCI compatible container images as a non root user. So that means if you on your local workstation or somewhere where you've just got a non root shell want to build and play with containers, you can build them with Builder and run them with Podman. And you don't have to worry about getting any special access. So, Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was a great talk. Um, Stephen has said he's going to send the slides through. So we will put those up on the sysadmin.miniconf.org site as soon as we get them. And you can refer to all the links that are in there. Um, if you have any questions, then please ask them in the chat alongside the video in Venulus. Um, and Stephen will be with you shortly to answer the questions. Thank you again, Stephen. Hey, thank you for having me.